is not uh, is not been able to join the meeting so uh, <clears throat> so now we are going to cover some of the latest ibc judgments uh, interesting ones which have uh, uh, rather given by nclt uh, high court uh, supreme court and clat as well as the nclts uh, just to update our refresh our knowledge all of us are professionals i believe everybody is ip here or is there some uh, someone from other some other profession or discipline all of all are ips right uh, anjali yes sir all are ips all are insolvency professionals so everybody knows how what it is uh, so we this is all just to learn and uh, together we can learn and refresh our uh, update ourselves with the different uh, latest judgments of the supreme court because law is ever evolving and uh, ibc being a new legislation and uh, uh, and we all know not all parts of it have been in force so it's actually a new legislation till date and there for the next one or two one doc one decade at least we'll keep seeing some dynamic changes through judgments or through some amendments or through regulations ibbi being overactive with its own uh, 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 sets of amendments and uh, it keeps uh, giving the latest circular also came late into personal bankruptcy just uh, two days back so <clears throat> this is how it's, it's dynamic so uh, sorry somebody wanted to say something okay so uh, I hope everyone uh, can hear me properly. Uh, am I audible? So, Anjali, no, you can. It's not clear, actually. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not clear. Yeah. Yes, sir. You are audible. It's, it's clear. I'm clear. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> anyways, so uh, we'll start with the. Uh, a uh, small presentation and we are going to discuss some seven or eight cases uh, on the recent case laws the topic being anatomy of ibc case laws so i uh, let me just present my screen it was there uh, any participant who had uh, attended uh, my november session in the ibc cases where i was the uh, faculty or the speaker is there anyone who had attended in november okay, no one so that's great okay Uh, can you see the screen, please? Can everybody see the screen? Yes, sir. All right. So, anatomy of IBC case laws. So, we are going to discuss some Supreme Court judgments first before uh, getting into other forums, other courts. And uh, the very first judgment is uh, the case of Vishal Chelani. Is the screen still uh, visible? The first, very first page, Vishal Chelani and others? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. I think I'm having some trouble. Okay. So, this is a case where uh, past Supreme Court has passed the judgment on 6th October 2023. So, a very recent one. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, proceedings were initiated under IB. And during the course of proceedings, the uh, due consultation with COC was done and a resolution was, a plan was presented. 
So this case particularly deals with the case of a distinction made between home buyers, two sets of categories of home buyers, one which had uh, elected for remedies such as applying before RERA and having secured orders in their favor, and those who did not do who did not go to RERA, but straight away filed their claim before the IRP or the RP in the CRP proceedings. So home buyers who had not approached the authorities under RERA were given benefit of 50% better terms than that given to those who had approached RERA or who were decree holders. So the appellants were uh, the ones who were uh, who had approached the RERA authority. So they were having uh, less benefit under the resolution plan. So they felt aggrieved and they filed their applications uh, before the adjudicating authority, that is the NCLT, and uh, their applications were rejected. Simultaneously, their appeals were also rejected by the NCLT against the NCLT order, rejecting their applications, uh, seeking grievance against the resolution plan. So consequently, they approached the Supreme Court. Can you see the next screen also? I'm I'm asking again and again because I'm getting some messages from Zoom meetings about uh, closing the program. Perhaps yes. I... So can yes. you see the next screen also? So court observations uh, specifically in this matter. <clears throat> uh, First is that on a plain reading, they refer to the section which defines financial debt. Plain reading of section 58F of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. No distinction is per se made out between different classes of financial creditors for the purposes of drawing a resolution plan. Just give me a minute. I think I, my system is hanging. Uh, let me just log in and come back. Just please, sir. I'm, I'm sorry I, to bear with me.
Uh, can you hear me? Can you see the screen, please? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> I talked about uh, the, the resolution plan providing dif different treatment to two kinds of sets of home buyers. One who had approached RERA and one who have not approached. The other ones who had not approached RERA. The ones who had not approached RERA were given more benefit than those who had approached RERA under the resolution plan. So, the, those who were uh, aggrieved by the resolution plan, they had moved the application that merely because we went to RERA, we should not be discriminated against. We should not be having a separate treatment because we all fall in one category as home buyers. So, in that, uh, they went to NCLT, their applications get dis got dismissed. And CLAT also dismissed their appeals and then they ultimately went to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court made these observations that on a plain reading of Section 5, 8, F, no distinction is per se made out between different classes of financial creditors for the purposes of drawing the resolution plan. So, while referring to the definition of financial debt, Supreme Court had made the observation no distinction per se is made out between different classes of financial creditors for purpose of drawing a resolution plan. Now, <clears throat> para 9, it says that the, the RP's view appears to be that once an allottee seeks remedies under RERA and opts for return of money in terms of the order made in her favor, it is not open for her to be treated in the class of home buyer. This court is unpersuaded by the submission. So, RP's submission in that matter was rejected. And it was further observed that it is only home buyers that, that can approach and seek remedies under RERA and no, not no other financial creditors. So in circumstances, to treat a particular segment of that class differently for the purposes of another enactment on the ground that one or some of them had elected to take back the deposits together with such interest as ordered by the competent authority would be highly inequitable. So the Supreme Court found inequity in treatment, separate treatment to those home buyers who had earlier gone to RERA before uh, also filing claims for the RP. So, also found it to be inequitable. Then it referred to a judgment of Natwar, Agar Natwar Agarwal, HUF, by the Mumbai bench of NCLT. So, the Supreme Court refers to NCLT Mumbai bench observations which had held that the underlying claim of an aggrieved party is crystallized in the form of a court order or decree. That does not alter or disturb the status of the concerned party in the present case of allottees as financial creditors. So even if a person has obtained a degree, that doesn't alter the status if that person is a financial creditor or not. So further, Section 238 of IBC also is being referred, containing a non obstantive clause, which gives override effect to its provisions. So that's why IBC provisions override the RERA provisions. So even if somebody had approached RERA, that doesn't mean that IBC will grant different treatment to different categories of home buyers. Consequently, its provision acquire primacy. It's mean IBC. The provision require primacy and cannot be read as subordinate to RERA. In any case, the distinction made by RP is artificial. So first they held this distinction to be inequitable second they also hold it to be artificial it also amounts to hyper classification and falls afoul of article 14 of the constitution of india so such an interpretation cannot therefore be countenanced so in a way it also went into the realm of fundamental rights the fundamental rights of home buyers because they were being discriminated against under article 14 also the conclusion by the Supreme Court, the appellants who were the home buyers who had won, went to, who also went to RERA, they were declared by the Supreme Court as financial creditors within the meaning of Section 58F explanation and entitled to be treated as such along with other home buyers for the purpose of resolution plan. That resolution plan in the matter was awaiting the final decision before the adjudicant authority. So this is only a question of law which was referred to the Supreme Court. Uh, the resolution plan was still seeking appropriate uh, approval from the NCLT. Any questions or doubts in uh, this particular case?
we can have an open discussion simultaneously uh, is there any doubt about why uh, treatment of uh, home buyers being discriminated against why it was being held like that okay so let me move to the next case then Now, the second case is uh, Totem Pudi Salalith versus State Bank of India. This is also Supreme Court. And the judgment was passed on 18th October 2023. <clears throat> In this case, the State Bank of India had filed a Section 7 application against the corporate debtor Totem Infrastructures Limited. Now, Prior to bringing the action under IBC, and it, these are quite interesting facts because uh, the matter was before different DRTs. So prior to bringing the action under IBC, there were notice was issued under Section 13, Subsection 2 of the Surface Act uh, to the corporate debtor and recovery proceedings were instituted against them before the DRT. So OA was also filed and uh, S and uh, 13 2 under surface C. Both actions were simultaneously taken by SBI. Now, there were three applications which were filed by the exposed lending banks. Applications being OA, two before DRT Hyderabad. The third application was filed before DRT Bengaluru. Now, three recovery certificates were issued. So, decree was granted by the presiding officer of DRT. The recovery certificates. Three different recovery certificates were issued by respective DRTs covering the claims of the lending banks. Two recovery certificates by the Hyderabad DRT. They were issued on 8th September 2015 and 17th October 2017 for a sum of rupees 14 crore 50 lakhs and rupees 1408 crores odd respectively. So the aspect of limitation will come here. So that's why dates are important. 2015, 8 September 2015, one recovery certificate was issued by one DRT. 17th October 2017, the second recovery certificate issued both by DRT Hyderabad. And the third OA, which was before, which was filed by SBBJ, the State Bank of Vikaner in Jaipur, the recovery certificate was issued on 4th August 2017 by for a sum of around 5 crore something by DRT Bengaluru. The SBI application under Section 7 of IBC was filed on in September 2019, 6th September 2019, before the NCLT. And it was found in, founded on all the three recovery certificates in which the first respondent had substantial stake. Now, in the order passed on 12th January 2021, the NCLT had admitted the Section 7 application. So, now what were the court observations? Because there was a challenge to the limitation, and these are direct observations of the Supreme Court. Specific observation that so far as the present proceeding is concerned, if we proceed on the basis that the date of initial default is the starting point of limitation, then lapse of three years from that day would have extinguished the bank's right to initiate action under IBC. Second, even if the said letter dated, so they talked about an acknowledgement also, even if the letter dated 29 January 2020 is treated to be acknowledgement of debt, the same was made after institution of proceeding under Section 7 of IBC. So even if an acknowledgement was there, that letter was given after the Section 7 filing of the Section 7 petition. So, which means that acknowledgement would not have extended the period of limitation. So, in the application, thus, there could be no reference to such acknowledgement. In absence of amendment of pleadings, the NCLAT could not have taken such purported acknowledgement of debt for purpose of extending the period of limitation. So, one issue that Supreme Court observed was that uh, uh, since uh, the acknowledgement letter was given after the institution of section 7 petition so therefore that acknowledgement cannot benefit the applicant 
especially when there was no amendment in pleadings and therefore the limit it will not extend the period of limitation however further observations came that one factor which has come to our notice para 12 in course of hearing is that one of the recovery certificate was issued on 8 september 2015 we have already held that the letter dated 29 january 2020 cannot by itself revive the debt though it could create an independent cause of action a question that arises now is as to whether debts in connection with the recovery certificate issued in year 2015 could form subject matter of an application under section 7 of IBC filed on 6 September 2019. So why? Because the RC was issued in September 2015 and the section 7 petition came four years later or almost four years later in September 2019. Now, the Supreme Court drew reference to a judgment of its own judgment in Kotak Mahindra Bank versus A. Balakrishna, where it was held that CRP could be brought within three years from the date of issue of recovery certificate. So, applying the judgment given in Kotak Mahindra Bank versus A. Balakrishna, the Supreme Court applied that ratio in its own facts. And then it held that we are not satisfied with the argument of appellant about maintainability of application out of which this appeal arise on the ground of application being barred under limitation. The application with respect to the two recovery certificates issued in the year 2017 is maintainable. Why? Because in 2019 the application was filed and two recovery certificates were issued in 2017 and all RCs were above 1 CR, above 1 crore. So in the event the appellate tribunal is of opinion that the CRP could not lie so far as recovery certificate of 2015 is concerned as the decree would be still alive the claim based on the said recovery certificate could be segregated from the composite claim and the COC shall in that event treat the sum reflected in the said recovery certificate as part of the claims made in pursuance of the public announcement. This direction was issued in exercise of jurisdiction under Article 142 of the Constitution of India, which is to do equity and justice. So, <clears throat> while upholding the limitation, the on principle it was upheld that since recovery certificate which was issued in 2015, uh, Section 7 could not have been filed in respect of that one, but since there were two other recovery certificates in the matter of 2017. So the section 7 IBC application was held to be maintainable. Also a very different or unique uh, 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 stand taken by Supreme Court that in exercise of their jurisdiction under article 142, they have included the RC amount of 2015 also in the claims for the purpose of uh, adjudication of composite, composite claim. Yeah, any doubts in this one? Uh, this was a very different case related to limitation aspect because we all know law is quite settled now that from the date of uh, commission of default, three years is the limitation period. And initially it used to be the NPA, NPA but now it is the date of default. Any comments, observations or... Uh, any suggestions or any doubts in relation to this judgment? Okay, so uh, then uh, we'll move to the third judgment. This is uh, judgment given by NCLT Kolkata Bench. So this is NCLT matter. Manakta Trade Link Private Limited versus Mani Karan Vincom Private Limited. Uh, judgment passed in October 2020th, October 2023. Uh, so the brief facts which were of the judgment were that uh, an application was filed under Section 7 of IBC by an assignee of debt, Manakta Trade Link Private Limited. The amount claimed to be in default was Rs. 2.72 crores 
as on 25th December 2022. The loan was sanctioned as an unsecured loan of Rs. 1 crore 40 lakhs by a signer that is SSA Higher Purchase Private Limited wide a loan agreement duly accepted and agreed to by the corporate debtor. The assigner had dispersed 1 crore 40 lakhs on 1st April 2016 and the disbursement was confirmed by the corporate debtor. The CD had also issued the received and promissory notes. It was the case of the applicant that is the assigner that the assigner had intimated the CD that the debt has been assigned in favor of Maratha Trading Private Limited and had requested the CD to make payment of the debt along with interest directly in favor of assignee. White letter dated 2nd May 2022. The CD wider letter dated 15th July 2022 acknowledged the debt and sought for extension of time in repayment of loan. However, the CD failed to make the payment. Now the respondent CD contended that the assignment was unregistered and the applicant had no local standard to file the application. It was further contended that once it is held that the assignment is invalid, the debt becomes time barred and the application will not legally survive. So the main contention of the CD was that the assignment agreement was an unregistered document and keeping in view the unregistered document, the debt itself was time barred. So what were the findings of NCLT Kolkata in this regard? First, that registration of assignment is not mandatory as per the Registration Act. Even otherwise, the corporate debtor never disputed the assignment till date. The CD was in correspondence with the applicant seeking time to repay the loan with interest and therefore at this stage, the respondent cannot question the validity of assignment. So first was that there is no need for registration of, a, of an assignment deed and even if it was then also because of its own conduct the question of validity of assignment cannot be put at this stage. The second observation the NCLT rely upon the decision in CFM Asset Reconstruction Private Limited versus Nickel Footwares an order of February 2023 of the NCLT where it was observed that uh, first in the observation a reference was made to the definition of financial creditor and para 9 if you see we are of the considered view that the assignment of debt essentially being a transaction between the creditor and the assignee and assignment being recognized by the IBC as a valid mode of transfer of rights across the ambit of section 5 clause 7 of the code Therefore, the entity who received the said assignment of debt falls within the fold of financial creditor. Further, we are persuaded by the decision of NCLAT in Lalan Kumar Singh versus Phoenix ARC, where the NCLAT, while reiterating the objectives of the court, observed that in the present case, we find that the appellant has sought declaration that the assignment made by HP SSBC to Phoenix is illegal which can be raised only in civil suit. So there was another aspect. First, our assignment is not registered, not mandatorily registered, required to be registered. Second, uh, even if uh, uh, it is required to be registered, then also by its own conduct, the CD cannot question it. Third, the even if the question can be raised, then that can be done only in a civil suit. The appellant is trying to convert the proceedings and the IBC as civil proceedings akin to a trial which is not the legislative intent. Therefore, considering the exemption provided under Section 5, Subsection 1A of Surface Act, we are not inclined to accept the contention that the said assignment agreement being unregistered is not legally enforceable. So, quite rightly, NCLT Kolkata has held that uh, an unregistered assignment deed can also be recognized creating a valid financial debt for the purpose of initiation of insolvency proceedings under section 7. Further in para 12 in a summary proceeding like the IBC proceedings it is out of the ambit of this adjudicating authority to go into the details as regard the requirement or exemption of registration of assignment agreement. 
So again, relying on that civil suit, if at all it can be questioned, it can be done only before a civil court, not before NCLT. In this background, the assignment cannot be challenged in the petition under section 7 of the code and as such, this issue cannot be decided by NCLT. Uh, for the last observation, it was also held that it is explicit and evidently discernible that there is a default of financial debt. The debt is in excess of threshold limit, which is of 1 CR, and the debt was not time barred. In view of the acknowledgement of debt by letter dated 15th July 2022, so therefore, Section 7 application was complete in this all respects and the application was admitted by the adjudicating authority. Any doubts or uh, any anything to be discussed in this one from the participants? Any doubt or any query? Anything to be discussed? Today we are not having many participants also, only 24 are there. Yes. Is something, somebody want to, want to say something? All right, so we'll move to the next case which is of uh, NCLT Hyderabad. This is SMC Infrastructures Private Limited versus State Bank of India. And uh, uh, facts of the case, they are uh, that an application was filed by SMC Infrastructures Private Limited, which is the successful RA in this case, under Section 60, Clause 5 of the Code, read with rule 11 of nclt rules seeking direction to the state bank of india which is the respondent in the application to release the proceeds of 62 lakhs 58297 uh, which was received by sbi in pursuant to surrender of an insurance policy held in cash credit account number so and so of the respondent to applicant number one tra <clears throat> held with the respondent so some insurance insured assured sum was received by State Bank of India in respect of an insurance policy uh, because of this surrender of insurance policy. And uh, uh, so the successful RA had uh, moved an application because SBI was not releasing the insured amount. Insured was the corporate debtor. So SBI was not releasing the insured amount in favor of the successful RA. Now, the corporate debtor had procured the insurance policy. The background is given with SBI Life Flexi Smart Plus bearing some policy number dated 14th October 2015 for its employee, namely Mr. Raja Shekhar, under employer and employee scheme from SBI Life Insurance Company Limited with a term of five years with effect from 8th October 2015. And Mr. K.V. Rajasekhar, MD of the CD, was nominated as a life assured under the said policy. So, the NCLT approved the resolution plan by its order dated March 30th, March 2021 in IA number 22 in accordance with the terms of the resolution plan, approved resolution plans. The management of CD had changed and the applicant was in control of the affairs of the corporate debtor. Applicant was SMC Infrastructures Private Limited. Now, the applicant had requested the respondent for release of the amounts received in lieu of the policy commencing from 5th January 2022 via various email. But the respondent, which is the SBI, neither transferred the same nor responded to the emails. So it was contented by the applicant, which is SMC infrastructure, the successful RA that the SBI had not right, no right to withhold the payment received by it on account of the aforesaid insurance policy. So major contentions of SBI in the matter were that first, the details regarding insurance amount were not mentioned in the IM. This is the SBI contentions. First, the details of insurance amount were not mentioned in the information memorandum. 
and the amount due from the company towards the surrender value of the policy was not included in the assets of the company and the amount was not taken into consideration by the rp while valuing the corporate debtor in the cib process so sbi first specifically raised questions that rp had not included this amount as a part of the im it is not part of the assets of the corporate debtor therefore for the purpose of crb proceedings second contention that the rp failed to collect and monitor the policy the insurance policy as, as a result it did not reflect in the assets of the cd and applicant number one bid for the company without taking the amount into consideration so one is the that the im did not specify it second the successful ra also did not bid for this amount this is the same argument said in the other other way around that the ra also did not bid for this amount while uh, while submitting its own resolution plan uh, the coc had approved the plan without having any knowledge about this amount so coc also had no knowledge about this amount surrender of policy and payments due occurred prior to approval of the resolution plan so the cd had surrendered the policy prior to approval of the resolution plan therefore the respondent being a secured creditor is entitled to the amount so sbi was withholding this amount in exercise of its rights as a secured creditor that was its contention third policy proceeds accrued post approval of the resolution plan is ill conceived and that the policy was surrendered in 2008-18 and the lock in period ended in october 2020 so the proceeds are accrued actually post approval of the resolution plan so that is why uh, it is out of the purview of ibc that is what the sbi contended and as a secured creditor it can always withhold some more amounts and the amount became due much earlier to the approval of the plan which has nothing to do with the plan and as such the applicant is not entitled to proceeds of 62 lakhs 58 thousand snc infrastructure they are talking about so the respondent sbi also placed reliance on provisions under section 68 so uh, conceptually also under the provisions of contract act the substantive provisions 68 69 70 71 and 72 which deal with unjust enrichment which can be defined as a benefit received at the expense of another so which is neither legal nor can be comprehended as a gift which against which the beneficiary has to pay reimbursement or restitution so by stating these provisions also as we are relied upon and made an argument that there will be unjust enrichment of the successful ra if the insured amount released to the sbi released in the bank account maintained by sbi i would say that is released to the successful ra then fifth point in the instant matter classifying the policy as a receivable debt rightfully and legally belongs to the secured creditors of the cd and not the applicant so uh, being a secured creditor sbi asserted its rights and said that successful ra is not entitled to this amount for all these five reasons majorly because the amount was not specified in the im resolution plan never considered this amount and it will lead to unjust enrichment also so in the rejoinder smc infrastructure which is the successful ra it had ever that cd was taken over by successful ra as a going concern which included both present assets as well as those that accrue to the corporate debtor at any point of time subsequently there cannot thus be exclusions in relation to any assets on any ground whatsoever unless specifically dealt in the approved resolution plan so perhaps we can safely presume that resolution plan never dealt with this part but uh, since the ra had taken over the corporate debtor as a going concern so everything coming to corporate debtor even after approval of resolution plan should rightly go to the successful ra so what does the nclt held in hold in this one it itself posed this question the nclt that whether the respondents act of withholding the amounts under the policy they received after the date of approval of resolution plan is correct and as per law and so the question was 
about whether the withholding of the amount by the SBI was itself legal or not. And the findings thereafter were that first, the according to the resolution plan, there cannot be any exclusions in relation to any assets of CD. With regard to the insurance policy, namely SBI Life Flexi Smart Plus, uh, for the MD of the corporate debtor under employer and employee scheme, the benefits of the policy will come back to the corporate debtor only. Second, as per chapter 7 of the resolution plan, it is stated that any security is held with such creditors in the form of security deposits, margin money, term deposit receipts or retention money shall not be adjusted against any outstanding of the corporate debtor and shall be directed to be returned, funded to the CD and the same shall be released upon fulfillment by the RA of all its obligations under the resolution plan. Though this insurance policy per se is not covered under this clause, as neither financial creditors nor RP were having knowledge of it, but the intent of this clause is very clear that any money with the third parties like creditors in the form of security deposits, margin money, stern deposit receipts, or detention money will be released to the CD. Further, this amount can be considered as retention money also as this was retained by insurance company on account of lock-in period clause in the insurance policy. So, first observation was that uh, the amount benefit of the policy will have to come back to the CD. Second, if any amount was withheld or it was, uh, uh, if it was uh, uh, deposited with any of the financial creditors, then also that amount had to be released in terms of the provisions made under the resolution plan itself. Third point, third observation, it is very clear that the amount payable by the insurance company belongs to the CD and the CD, which is now the new management is entitled for the same. Further, in terms of the approved resolution plan, there is no such clause, clause which provides for payments of receivables to the CD creditors. So, uh, the resolution plan never approved any clause which stated that the payment of receivables will be to the creditors. And second, the CD itself is being the beneficiary, all the benefits under the policy then will have to go to the successful RA. Now, on the basis of the facts and legal position as stated above, the respondent SBI was held not entitled to the amount. So, its withholding was held to be illegal or not correct as per well. So, uh, any questions, any doubts in this one? It's a quite interesting case because insurance matters also came under the CIP proceedings post acceptance of the resolution plan. And uh, NCLT has, Hyderabad has very keenly observed that any benefits under the policy then will have to go back to the corporate debtor, which means to the successful RA in the facts and circumstances of the case. Secured creditor by themselves cannot uh, withhold any amount which they receive in the bank account of a corporate debtor mm -hmm. merely because they happen to be secured creditor and should uh, adjust the remaining amount after whatever haircut they took in the through the receivables for the receivables post the acceptance of the resolution plan. I hope uh, this uh, everybody is able to. Uh, understand what uh, has been discussed here and uh, any questions uh, because I'm not receiving any any responses yet so that's why I'm just asking I hope I'm 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 not too fast with this So shall we proceed further or should we take a break? Uh, Anjali is there? Yes, sir. We can take a break? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Okay. So we'll just take a 10 minutes break and then we'll come back. Okay, sir. Okay.
Yeah. So shall we start again? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, any doubts about any of these first three, four cases, four cases that we've discussed? Anything, anything to share? Anyone, any of, of our fellow IPs, any personal experience to share it with any of the issues that have arose? Okay. Okay, so let me just share the presentation. Yeah, so we stopped at the SMC infrastructures is the last case that we did in which the insurance policy matter was there. Then the NCLT ultimately ruled that SBI is wrongfully withholding the insurance policy amount which had to be rightfully given to the successful resolution applicant. Now, the next case is Radha Syria Properties Private Limited versus Jay Narayan Gupta Liquidator. So, it's a liquidation matter. And uh, in this case, a Section 65 application was filed by Radha Syria Properties Private Limited, which is the applicant against Jay Narayan Gupta, liquidator of the CD. Seeking directions, seeking directions uh, to liquidator to refund an amount of rupees twenty three lakhs eighty eight thousand two eighty to the applicant. So the facts were that uh, there was no resolution plan which was received by the RP and pursuant there to the NCLT had passed an order of liquidation wide an order dated twenty fourth January twenty twenty two. And the respondent was appointed as liquidator. The applicant was the propounder of a composite scheme of compromise and arrangement between Radha Syria Properties Limited and creditors of Barkal Enterprises Limited. So the applicant was a propound, propounder or proponent of a composite scheme of compromise and arrangement. The applicant came to know that the liquidation process was started against the CD. And on 16th February 2022, uh, the applicant wrote a letter to the liquidator expressing its interest in submitting a scheme of compromise and arrangement and requested to provide information, documents, inspection of assets, etc. in respect of the corporate debtor. So the applicant proposed to actually propose a scheme of compromise and arrangement in respect of, uh, in relation to all the creditors of the corporate debtor. Uh, on 15th March 2022, the applicant submitted its scheme to the liquidator. So the scheme was also submitted to the liquidator. And upon request from the liquidator, on 20th April 2022, the applicant deposited rupees 7 lakhs 88,000 in the account of the corporate debtor. Now, between April to May 2022, several communications were exchanged between the applicant and the respondent on multifarious drafts of scheme and subsequently on 12th May 2022 the liquidator accepted the proposed scheme of compromise and arrangement. So after acceptance of the proposed scheme of compromise and arrangement and an application was filed being IA number 495 of 2022 seeking direction before the NCLT to direct the liquidator to conduct the meeting of writers under the regulation 2B of IBBI liquidation process regulations read with section 230 of the Companies Act. Now in December 2022, the liquidator on repeated occasions insisted on depositing half of the scheme amount in the CD's bank account. So the liquidator had insisted on the applicant to deposit the half of the scheme amount in the CD's bank account. 
the NCLT with order dated 6th January 2023 allowed the application and directed the liquidator to hold a meeting of creditors under Section 230 of the Companies Act. So the NCLT granted approval of the scheme with a direction to the to the liquidator to hold a meeting of creditors. So a provisional, it will say a provisional, it passed the first test of NCLT, but now the creditors had to approve the scheme. Now in February 2023, the applicant time and again made certain payments to the liquidator, total amounting to 23 lakhs 88,280. On 1st March 2023, the liquidator informed the applicant that a meeting of creditors was held on 17th February 2023 wherein the scheme had been rejected by the creditors. So NCLD had allowed to the liquidator to hold a meeting of creditors, but the creditors rejected the scheme of arrangement, scheme, proposed scheme. <clears throat> now on 21st March, 21st March, the scheme was rejected by creditors. On 21st March, the applicant wrote a letter to the liquidator requesting him to forthwith refund the aggregate total amount of 23,88,000 which was deposited by him before the liquidator before in the CD's bank account. Now the liquidator liquidation process till 17th February 2023 amounts to 24 lakhs 12,172 of which the applicant has paid 23 lakhs 88,000. So the liquidator takes a different stand that the entire liquidation cost till 17th February 2023 amounted to around 24 lakhs. But the applicant had paid 23 lakhs so the applicant is liable to remit the rest amount of 23,000 to the respondent liquidator as the liquidation cost. So the question is whether the applicant is entitled to refund from the liquidator or not in such a case. The question which was posed by adjudicating authority was whether the liquidator is entitled to claim his fee and other costs in relation to liquidation from the applicant who is a proponent of a composite scheme of compromise and arrangement when the scheme proposed by him is rejected by the creditors. So relevant provision related to this uh, aspect is first the liquidation process regulations, liquidation regulation, regulation 2B, sub-regulation 3, which states that any cost incurred by the liquidator in relation to compromise or arrangement shall be borne by the CD where such compromise or arrangement is sanctioned by the tribunal under subsection 6 of section 230. Provided that such costs shall be borne by the parties who proposed compromise or arrangement where such compromise or arrangement is not sanctioned by the tribunal under subsection 6 of section 230. Uh, further, the, this is what the regulation 2B states. So in case it is sanctioned by the NCLT, then CD will bear the cost. If it is not sanctioned, the party who is proposing to compromise the arrangement will have to bear the cost. Now, subsection 6 of section 230 of Companies Act, what does that provide? That there at a meeting held in pursuance of subsection 1, a majority of persons representing three-fourths in value of the creators or class of creators or members of class of creators voting in person or by proxy agree to compromise our arrangement and if such compromise arrangement is sanctioned by the NCLT by an order the same shall be binding on the company all the creditors or class operators or members of class of members or in case of a company being wound up on the liquidator and the contributories of the company. So section 230 subsection 6 provides for voting by a uh, majority of three-fourths of uh, the persons attending the meeting who are the creators. Now, in relation to these provisions, the finding of NCLT came that a combined reading of section, Regulation 2B, Sub-Regulation 3 of the Liquidation Regulations and Section 230, Subsection 6 of the Companies Act envisages that if any cost is incurred by the liquidator, 
in relation to compromise or arrangement sanctioned by the tribunal, it shall be borne by the corporate debtor. So, any cost incurred by liquidator has to be borne by the corporate debtor. Further, provided to Rule 2B, subsection rule, sub Rule 3 of the liquidation regulations, it provides for bearing of cost by parties who proposed compromise or arrangement only when such a scheme is not sanctioned by tribunal. So the party has to bear the cost only when the scheme is not sanctioned by the tribunal under subsection 6 of section 230 of Companies Act. The scheme proposed by the applicant was rejected unanimously at its first motion of compromise or arrangement and this NCLT does not have any scope to sanction the scheme. So once the scheme was rejected by the creditors themselves, then there was no scope for the NCLT to sanction that scheme. Therefore, there was no case made out by the liquidator for invoking proviso to Rule 2B3 of liquidation process regulations. Thus, we are in view that all the costs incurred by liquidator in relation to compromise arrangement, including liquidator fee, were wrongly claimed from the applicant. So, the applicant was entitled to refund from the liquidator. Ultimately, all the cost has to be borne by the CD. Uh, any doubts or any anything to discuss in this one? In this case? Okay. Next case, uh, this is an unclad case held by NCLAT. Ryan Hotels and Resorts versus Unrivaled Projects Private Limited. Just give me a second. Yeah. So the NCLT was considering two applications here. One was an IA 3694 of 2023 and the other was IA number 1956 of 2023 in two different appeals. Seeking condonation of delay in filing the appeals under section 61 of IBC. Where challenge was made to the orders passed by the respective NCLT. So there were two common uh, uh, two IAs in diff two different appeals where a common question of condemnation of delay in filing the appeals was invoked. Now, in IA number 3694 of 2023, it was stated that the order was pronounced by the NCLT on 8th May 2023, but copy of the order was neither provided to the appellant nor uploaded on the website. So, order was pronounced on 8th May 2023, but copy was not provided. The appellant claimed to have addressed an email on 15th May 2023 for providing a copy of the order. It is stated that the copy of the order was emailed to the appellant on 2nd June 2023. So the pronouncement was made on 2nd 8th May 2023, but it was emailed on 2nd June 2023. So it's almost almost one, one month. Thereafter, the appeal was he filed on 4th July 2023. It is pleaded in the application that it is a trite law that a period of limitation is to be computed from the date of knowledge of the order. It is the case of the appellant that the limitation would start running from the date of knowledge of the same. Just give me a second. Yes. Uh, so in this case, 8th May 2023 order was passed and it was received on 2nd June 2023. So claim was that limitation should be countered from the date of knowledge of the order or from the date of receipt of the order. Uh, appeal was filed on 4th July. It was pleaded that uh, the limitation would start running from the date of knowledge of the order and therefore there is delay of only one day. However, according to the registry, the delay was of 27 days. It was further pleaded in the order and the application that the appellate tribunal was closed for summer vacations from 2nd June till 3rd July 2023. Hence the period to be excluded from computing the period of limitation. So even the vacation period was supposed to be excluded from the period of limitation. That was the contention. 
Now, the respondent in its reply stated that the appellant had not applied for certified copy of the order. So first was that since certified copy was not applied at all, so there was no, there was no scope for the applicant appellant to claim any benefit. Second, the communication sent to the registry on 15th May was not to obtain certified copy of the order. The period of limitation for preferring the appeal shall commence from 8th May. That is the date of pronouncement on the date when the order was pronounced. It was also submitted that as per the notice dated 30th May 2023 issued by the registrar, even during the period of annual summer vacation of the tribunal, from 5th June to 2nd July, the registry of this tribunal continued to function and e-filing was operational. Therefore, registry had correctly mentioned that there is a delay of 27 days. So, which means the court was not functioning, but the registry was open. Court was not hearing matters. That was the only thing. Registry was functional. Appellant could have filed appeal even during the vacations. Appellant having not applied for certified copy of the order, he is not entitled for any exclusion. Appeal being barred by time deserves to be rejected. Now, the second IA, the other appeal on the same continuation of delay ground. In this, the ground taken in the application was that the impugned order was passed on 12th January 2023 and the appellant applied certified copy on 6th February. So in this case, certified copy was applied but after one month and a certified free of cost copy was received by the applicant on 8th February. It was stated in the application that some time was taken to review the impugned order and discussing and deliberating upon filing of an appeal before the NC, before the NCLAT. The appellant could provide instructions to prepare for filing the accompanying appeal on or around 20th February 2023. Thereafter, the appellant's legal counsel commenced drafting of the appeal and first draft was circulated on 1st March. Certified copy was dispatched to the appellant's counsel, which was received on 27th February. A draft appeal was internally reviewed and approved on 10th March. Thereafter, appeal was filed on 11th March. So the impugned order was passed on 12th January and almost after two months, the appeal was filed. The appellant's case herein was that the date of limitations has start from the date when the appellant received the copy of the order. Hence, there is a delay of only one day in filing the appeal. Because in this case, the certified copy was applied and on 6th February and the certified copy was received on 8th February. So in both cases, commonly, the court raised the question that whether limitation for filing an appeal under section 61 of IBC, it shall commence from the date of the order or from the date when contents of the order are known to the agreed party. That is the date when copy of the order is received by an agreed party. Now findings are that the present is a case where order is pronounced by the NCLT in accordance with the statutory rules, namely NCLT rules. In the facts of both the appeals, the orders were pronounced by the NCLT in presence of counsel for the appellant. The first observation, order was pronounced in presence of counsel. Thus, the knowledge of the order has to be constructively communicated on the appellant and it is not open for the appellant to state that they were not aware of the contents of the order. So once order is announced, the decision is known. So the NCLAT holds that you cannot say that you are not aware of the order on the date of announcement. Limitation for filing of the appeal does not commence on the date when appellant became aware of the contents, but it shall commence when order was pronounced. Uh, the orders passed by the NCLT were pronounced in the open court in the presence of the counsel for the appellant. In any view of the matter, they cannot contend that they do not have even constructive knowledge of the order on the set date. Knowledge of the order has to be actual or constructive knowledge. And when the orders are pronounced, it can very well be said that the constructive knowledge has to be imputed to the contents of the order to an agreed party. In event, the submission of the appellant is accepted that unless the contents of the order are known to an agreed party, he cannot exercise the right of appeal and period of limitation for filing an appeal shall not commence till he is aware of the contents of the order. So, uh, 
so that means that even from from the date of pronouncement even when the order is not received the period of inflation will begin to run uh if further observed that ibc is a statute which provides for timely resolution and liquidation of the cd timeline for various acts are prescribed the supreme court in v nagarajan has held that section 61 has to be interpreted keeping in view the purpose and object of the code and section 61 has to be put to interpretation in appeal when a grieved party or appellant is aware of the contents of the order so this uh, submission that only about the awareness of awareness of contents of order the limitation will start cannot be accepted further section 12 of the limitation act provides for exclusion of time taken in obtaining certified copy of an order after an order is pronounced which pronouncement is well known to the appellant in the present case it was open for them to apply for certified copy of order even if they are not aware of the contents of the order as per their submissions on that date certified copy of the order could have been very well obtained by them and time taken in preparing certified copy of the order is required to be excluded it is the scheme of limitation act which has been held to be applicable in ibc proceedings law clearly provides opportunity to an agreed party to obtain certified copy and file an appeal after exclusion of period obtaining in certified copy of the order legislative scheme takes care of all situations where order was pronounced by a court it is expected for the parties that is important it is expected for the parties to diligently apply for certified copy of order in the event there may be any chance to file an appeal limitation for filing an appeal under 61 shall commence from the date when the order is pronounced and not from the date when agreed party or appellant claims to have knowledge of contents of the order so this means that even when the certified copy is uh, applied after one month the benefit will be given only for the period from the date of application of certified copy and the date of receipt so the rest of the period the benefit will not be given for reasons said to have the appellate authority rejected the application seeking condemnation so looking at these uh, for if in any of us wants to file an appeal before nclat uh, against the order of the adjudicating authority then at least we are not aware of the contents of the order one has to apply for certified copy so that one has one has a proof to seek exclusion of time period for the purpose of limitation any any questions any doubts in this one okay now the seventh case uh, this is of 11th october 2023 passed by nclat new delhi bench principal bench amrop india private limited versus high tech gears limited in this case the appeal was filed under section 61 of the code by the appellant against the order dated 16th june 2023 passed by the nclt whereby the nclt rejected the section 9 application filed by the oc so this is an oc case an appeal was filed where against the rejection of a section 9 application of the oc uh, the copy debtor here was messrs high tech gears limited and section 9 applicant was amrop india private limited now the cd brief facts are that the cd had entered into two separate contracts uh, dated 12 february 2018 and 8 march 2018 with amrop india Cons consultants limited for filling up two vacancies in the company aicpl raised four invoices for the services rendered aicpl subsequently sold their business to amrop which is the present appellant by entering into a slump sale agreement with them so aicpl sold its business to amrop claiming that all properties assets liabilities rights benefits and interest of aicpl should transfer to them the appellant sent a letter on 28 june 2018 demanding payment of 2965000 from the cd the cd replied on 13 july denying the outstanding amount and instead raised a counter claim of 137 lakhs the appellant thereafter sent a demand notice under section 8 of ibc uh, to the cd on 30th july 2018 to which the cd sent a notice of dispute on 9th august 2018 the appellant then filed a section 9 application before the nclt to which the cd filed reply 
and the NCLT passed the incoming order on 16th June 2020, rejecting the Section 9 application. Assailing the NPU order, the AOC refer, preferred the appeal. And the contentions made before the NCLT were that the appellant had contended that the NCLT, after examining the slum slale agree agreement, had gone into the question of whether an operational debt had become due and payable to the appellant. The NCLT had rightly held that, in view of slum slale agreement, the invoices raised by AICPL on CD had become payable to the appellant. However, where the NCLT went wrong was in coming to the conclusion that there was a pre-existing dispute between the parties by relying on certain emails of CD in which the deficiency of services had been raised. So the question here was about the existing dispute, whether it was there or not. So the appellant asserted that the first invoice became due and payable upon signing of the contract. First invoice became due upon signing of contract. The first invoice pertained to payments which had become due and payable on confirmation of assignment or signing of contracts. The amount payable against this invoice had become due and payable on signing of contract itself and therefore this payment cannot be linked to the quality of services delivered by the EOC. So the amount became due on the date of signing the contract and it had nothing to do with the services or the quality of the services. So that was the contention made to rebut the contention of existence of a pre-existing dispute. Second, there was a contention that uh, the, the respondent had contended that after considering all facts and circumstances, the NCLT arrived at the correct finding that there was sufficient material on record which evidenced pre-existing dispute. It was also contended that the OC was trying to hoodwink the existing disputes by trying to create a confusion that the executive search contract was not a composite contract by contriving artificial stages in the contract. It was also pointed out that the OC had been informed by an email dated 29th April 2018 about gaps in performance of search contract, which were followed by several other emails highlighting their performance failure in filling up two vacancies as per the search contract, besides calling them for meetings to discuss how to find a solution to the impasse which had arisen. These emails were issued prior to Section 8 demand notice, clearly signifying existence of the existing dispute. So what was referred were some further communication showing disputes between the parties before the Section 8 demand notice was issued. The question before the NCLT was whether there was any genuine pre-existing dispute surrounding the debt claimed by OC to be due and payable to them by the CD. The findings of the NCLT are that for first, from a plain reading of the provisions, it is clear that the existence of dispute and its communication to OC is therefore statutorily provided in Section 8. In the present case, it is an undisputed fact that the demand notice was issued by OC on 30 July 2018 and notice of dispute was raised by the CD on 9th August 2018. It is also, so which means within 10 days. It is also an undisputed fact in the present matter that the OC did not receive any payment from CD and therefore proceeded to file an application under Section 9 of IVC. It is also settled that for a pre-existing dispute to be a ground to nullify an application under Section 9, the disputes to raise must be truly existing at the time of filing a reply to notice of demand as contemplated by Section 8, Subsection 2 of the Code or at the time of filing the Section 9 application. So the dispute should be genuinely existing between the parties. In the present factual matrix, the defense raised by CD cannot be held to be moonshine, spurious, hypothetical, or illusory. The tone and tenor of emails exchanged between the parties clearly manifest existence of dispute which antedates Section 8 demand notice. So the dispute which was there before the issuance of a Section 8 demand notice was held to be a genuine pre-existing dispute. It is well settled that in Section 9 proceeding, there is no need to enter into final adjudication with regard to existence of dispute between the parties regarding operational debt. For such disputed operational debt, Section 9 proceeding under Section under the IBC cannot be initiated at the instance of the OOC. The NCLT has therefore correctly noted that the conditions laid down in Section 9 having not been fulfilled, the application deserves to be rejected. So NCLAT has 
approved the NCLT's observations that there was a pre-existing dispute because of exchange of email communications between parties showing a dispute between them even prior to issuance of a demand notice under section 8. Any questions or doubt in this one? It's quite settled also that pre-existing disputes, they have to be, even if there is no case going on between the parties, even then uh, a party can show a valid pre-existing dispute between them. Okay, so now the last case is of Kotak Mahindra Bank. Again, an NCLAT decision, Kotak Mahindra versus Resolution Professional of Universal Buildwell Private Limited. In this case, the appeal was filed against the order dated 5th October 2021, by which order the NCLT New Delhi bench rejected an application being IEA number 4472 of 2021. The CRB was initiated against the CD on an application of FC by order dated 3rd July 2018. The appellant had filed an application in Teralia praying that the CLT may recall, modify, amend the order dated 3rd July 2018, whereby CIRP was initiated for the CD as a whole and instead order and direct that the admission and CIRP is only in respect of the universal or a project of the CD. So, it was an application seeking recall, modification or amendment of an order whereby the CIRP was initiated as a whole and instead what the applicant sought was a direction that the admission and CIRP is only in respect of universal or, or a project of the corporate debtor. Now, the NCLT, it heard the application and took the view that there is no provision available to the NCLT for review of its own order by the NCLT. Hence, the application was rejected. The appellant contended that since the FC, which were the home buyers, were confined to one project, hence the NCLT ought to have confined the CIRP with regard to one project only and the NCLT has not correctly appreciated the prayers made by the appellant and rejected the same. Now, the finding of the NCLT are that there can be no dispute to the proposition that in appropriate case, NCLT could have directed relying on the judgment of this tribunal in Flat Buyers Association, Winter Hill Gurgaon versus Umang Realtek for project-wise insolvency. But when the proceeding and NCLT has directed initiation of insolvency against the CD, on the application of the appellant, NCLT could not have modified the initiation of CRP by confining the CRP to one project. So, which means uh, there cannot be a modification of an earlier order because of uh, because the section 7 application, in this case, the home buyers, they had themselves referred to, they had referential referred to uh, um, the CD being uh, among universal buildwell private limited so then thereafter there cannot be an amendment that only universal or a project of the corporate debtor can go into insolvency so having said that so the nclt's jurisdiction to modify or amend its own order was denied so uh, this is one of the interesting things because uh, reverse crp process we all talk about it Supreme Court has also done in done this in one or two matters and NCLAT has also started it. So, but uh, in this case, this was denied, especially because the NCLT could not modify or amend its own orders. Any questions or doubts in respect of any of the eight cases that we've discussed? Or any doubts in relation to any aspect of CIRP? that uh, we can share with each, each other. Sir, kindly go to case number two. Number two? Yeah. Yes. 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 The SBI is one. 
This one you are saying, sir? I think it is uh, regarding uh, the recovery uh, certificates. Ah, uh, recovery certificates. Ah, uh, not that. Yes. Um, it is regarding uh, a compromise arrangement. Is there section one uh, two thirty? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, where it says it provides for payment of fee. Correct. Uh, but uh, at the end uh, uh, here. Yeah, this one. So, uh, section uh, 230, I think, uh, of Indian Companies Act provide, clearly provides for payment of fee if the same is uh, compromised settlement is uh, scheme is rejected by the creditors. Correct. Okay. But uh, at the end, of the conclusion, I could not pursue that, sir. At the end, of the court gave a conclu conclusion stating that it is not recoverable. It is, the uh, liquidator is not in order in recovering the amount from the uh, um, provider from of the, the compromise scheme. From so the procedure. here I could not get the uh, logic, uh, analogy, I could not get the analogy. See, the liquidator is seeking the entire liquidation costs. Okay. From the compromiser, okay. from the proposer. Liquidator okay. here was relying on statutory provisions and okay. claim that he has rightly taken money from the applicant in the liquidator furnished details of liquidation cost during the period of compromise arrangement and claimed that the overall cost incurred during liquidation process till 17th have amounted to 24 lakhs. Okay. So, uh, uh, here, these are the only two provisions that are in relation to this. First okay. is in case there, the, the sanction is given by the NCLT, then the compromise arrangement has to be borne by the corporate debtor. But in case such cost is borne by the parties, uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, where it is not sanctioned, then it has to be borne by the parties. Okay. Now, to be really frank, uh, uh, going with this logic, since it was not sanctioned by the creditors, so by with that logic, NCLT has also not sanctioned it. I think this, this is the doubt that you are having, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm absolutely with you. This 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 logic is absolutely fine that NCLT had no occasion to sanction it. So which means this this compromise arrangement was never sanctioned. So yeah. which also means that uh, in such a case where there is no sanction, the proviso will be applicable. Okay. Yeah, but perhaps I believe in the facts, whatever we have read the judgment, the liquidator has sought the liquidation cost during the uh, period, of, period of compromise scheme. The period of compromise that the overall cost incurred. But they have claimed that and claimed that the overall cost incurred during the liquidation process. So okay. it might be a case that he might have included the entire costs. Okay. In that case, to the, the NCLT would have sanctioned the, the appropriate amount which was correct, eligible. Correct. I am with you. I am with you. But perhaps yeah. this order was never appealed against. <laughs> but in this case, okay, of course, it was since it is not recommended by the Committee of Creditors, so NCLT is appropriate, perfectly in order in not taking up the case. But uh, who will bear the cost? Then who should have borne the cost? Tell me. The applicant itself, if it is all related to compromise and arrangement, proviso is clear, very clear that the parties by whom the proposal has come. That will wear the cost. Okay. If you see the proviso, can you see the pointer? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so provided that such cost shall be borne by the parties who proposed compromise or arrangement where such compromise or arrangement is not sanctioned by the tribunal under subsection 6 of 230. Okay. So perhaps the confusion here in the facts was that initially NC Healthy had approved a creditor's meeting okay. for the purpose of sanction. But, but okay. that was not a sanction at all. Because it was yeah, only yeah. for calling a creditor's meeting. Okay, okay. That that I am okay. I'm aware of. I could get it. That's correct. But, uh, uh, where from the okay, uh, it's clear. Right. Where from the amount to be claimed? Of course, the uh, liquidator is entitled to get. So, no, so, so in this, in this case, sir, a liquidator had already asked the applicant to first deposit a particular amount, which okay. was around twenty three lakhs. He uh, incurred around twenty four lakhs. So if in such cases, as a liquidator, one should first call for deposit of the amount of cost. Okay. 
to be incurred in such cases, which will be almost because he must have already estimated that this is going to be the amount of charges in the publication and all those things calling for COC uh, for the creditors meetings. So, um, given that aspect, uh, I believe uh, uh, liquidators should first call upon the proposer to first deposit the amount. Before it seems almost to 95 percent of the amount has been deposited, got deposited, except 23,000 rather, entire Absolutely. amount got deposited. But yes. even in that case, tribunal ordered him to refund the amount. I know, I know. I mean, the regulation speaks something else, and the NCLT has actually really gone against it. Okay. I'm with you on this. Okay. okay. But I was waiting for somebody to make this response. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So sir. I'm okay. I'm happy. I'm happy you have read this. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Any other doubt, sir? No, sir. No, sir. I think <laughs> fine. Fantastic. But I am with you on this. Perhaps this is the wrong decision, but this has not been appealed against to my knowledge. Yeah, this my is doubt the is the, the... Yeah, this is the name of the case. This we can also find out. Uh, the decision came in 2023 only. So perhaps this might uh, I am quite sure that the uh, the proposer must have won the appeal in this case. Yeah. Sir, in this, this is a very very important case. Uh, is it possible to uh, share us the your uh, uh, this uh, yes, uh, yes. presentation, sir? We'll share. We'll, we'll, share. we'll share. We'll share. I see. With the permission I, of the uh, with the there, permission I, of the IPA. Yes. Uh, with oh, yeah. the permission of the sponsor. Uh, oh, they they have to. They they always ask from me. So that's okay. Okay. In that case, for it's circulation. Yes. It's a very good, very important case, sir. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Right. Any other doubt, sir? Any other doubt <clears throat> to all the participants? Yeah, I have a question with regard to whom by CIRP. Ji, Arunji. Now, you see, because we are talking about the project. Right. So they say project-wise insolvency. Always, project is always one. If you see any, any uh, uh, buildings, uh, one or two uh, builder, if you see the project is approved by RERA and maybe different towers under the project. Correct. So interchangeably, we are using the one word which is called as a project wise insolvency or CIRP, Correct. which to me, it seems to be difficult to identify because if you see, if you look at the records of RERA, there is only one project and now it is in the different phases, which is implemented in terms of construction of towers. Correct. No, sir. What so is now, doubt? Yeah. Yeah, doubt, doubt is so we see project wise insolvency, project wise CARP. It is not yeah. a project wise. If you know if there are the 10 towers in a one project and mm -hmm. one tower has been constructed or two or three towers have been constructed on a progress and rest of the towers have not been constructed. So to whom we called as a project and to whom we called as a towers. This is to what why what so is your you are view trying to it? say that there should be further division in a project? And it should be done tower wise. Yes, because you know, if you see project, because project has to be identified from the records. Correct. And the project is approved. Suppose if you take an example of an order authority, the project is an Aranya project. And Correct. maybe the different towers A, B, C, D, E, F under this project. Absolutely. So how can we say that every tower is a project? Project uh, is only one, but maybe the towers, maybe one to ten, one to ten. Correct. So there can, which means that a project will comprise of more than one towers. So we will not mm -hmm. say that one tower will, will that's correct. So uh, this is what the NCLT also held in this matter. I think you're saying this in the context of universal will take case. Correct? No, no, I'm not talking about that. No, 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 I'm not. But this one. I, 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 I'm talking in general because I have two or three doubts. That's why I took a liberty to just uh, uh, to know your views on the There are two issue. things like uh, if you see uh, there are two things. I have seen some projects uh, in which uh, the company has four or five projects at different locations. One in Faridabad, one in Haryana, one in some other, one in uh, Gurgaon, one in Faridabad. And then there are two, three more projects. But in such cases, uh, uh, project-wise insolvency can is only appreciable in only such cases where the remaining projects of the company are going on pretty well 
and there is only default in one project. Financial default in one project or the timelines are being missed in only one project. The rest of the projects are being done successfully by the corporate data. In such cases, perhaps, and that is why reverse CRP by the NCLAT, when it was introduced, it had introduced basically for that purpose only, where a company has, let's say, more than 15, 20 projects. Let us say the example of Parshamnath. It has so many projects all over uh, NCR or uh, elsewhere. So in such cases, if let's say one project starts failing for any which reasons. So by taking the entire company into insolvency, the it might lead to suffer suffering of the other projects, which are actually going on pretty well. Now, having said that, but there are many companies in which all projects are gone. All projects are down. In such cases, reverse CIRP is not advisable. The entire company as a whole will go into CIRP. There is also one more practical difficulty as RPs that we, we might face that where the accounts are not properly managed project wise. I'm talking about money trail not being properly maintained project wise, especially in practical situations where usually in such cases, enforcement director also and ED has also already attached the assets or in such cases, the promoters are absconding, records are not available. In such cases, it is very much difficult to find out all the bank account details also. It is also very much difficult to find out which investor's money went into which project. And so in such cases, perhaps it is advisable if the, all the projects are gone, if or are gone in the sense they are or they have missed the timelines, they have then all should be pulled in together in a single insolvency proceeding. But in case it is easily classifiable, the money trail, it is easily classifiable and the rest of the projects are going on pretty well. Then in such cases, only one project should go into insolvency and perhaps IBBI is also, uh, the proposed amendments are already there in this respect. But uh, we have yet to see the light of the day. Those amendments are yet to be enforced. They have to be enacted also. So that is my personal view. I don't know uh, how you will agree with it or not. But uh, as far as towers Still, are concerned, I believe all towers will be a part of one project only. So I have nothing to say that. Uh, I don't think so. Anyone would say that one tower is one project. They are all part of a single project. Even if it if one project comprises of, let's say, five or six towers, they will be part of one project only. Uh, no, second is uh, the concept of a going concern. Because if you look at uh, the enterprise or the company or the corporates as well as while we compare with this home buyer CIRP. So what is this? Because the going concern has not been defined so far as the definition of this IBC provisions or the regulation there under is concerned. Because this is a very general concept which has been taken from the accounting standards or from the companies that like this. Correct, correct, correct. So we say we say under the wrap of going concern, I have seen some of the project which will be unfair on my part to take name of that project or the RPE. Mm -hmm. But now I, I, I fairly with the due respect, I say this is a manipulation like that. I will tell you the example. They say we will complete the this uh, particular flat. You give me the money, this RP says, because this is a going concern. And arbitrarily, he is providing or he is awarding the contract to any of the contractor, to some of the contractor, without seeking approval from the COC. Because if you look at the minutes of the COC, there mm -hmm. is no resolution appointing a particular contractor for completing that particular tower. Mm -hmm. And arbitrarily, the prices, because there's a construction price has gone up like this. Suppose the company was formed of, say, nine, uh, 2012. Now it has gone in a CIRP, say 2020. So now the price is inflation rate is there. I will decide to what I have to charge from you. So mm. this is to what, because this is my responsibility as a going concern to take it there off. Correct, correct. So under the rep of a going concern, because this is a very, very subjective and is a very confusing, it's a going concern. What is the powers, responsibilities and the duties of the RP so far as the home buyers project is concerned. Now the second beauty of this part is that once the project is completed, if you see, you see uh, what he says, you you pay me the uh, you you pay me what you have agreed in a BBA. 
So in a BBA, the prices were agreed in 2012. Now the inflation rate is 20% more. He says, you pay me this price, but I will not complete A, B, C, D because the price have gone up. I will give you the basic O. So they say, this is my discretion, which is not minuted in the COC and still RP is charging. So I don't understand. So what is happening? No, and secondly, personally, I would say yeah. because these are all decisions which should be approved by COC. If yes. they are not approved by COC, perhaps there is, there is some fault then in the CRP process. Perhaps he should seek approval. In case, in such cases, RP has not taken approval, then FC should approach the RP. Do you please call a meeting, seek a voting also on this agenda. And then I think perhaps uh, depending on the vote only, the RP should act. Now, secondly, I, I, I am taking it further. Now, the RP is transferring the flat because you know, I'm taking an example of an authority. The project has not been completed. And the person, and now he is under great, uh, he is under, you know, severe uh, 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 stress of financial burden. So they say there is some bias also there. And there's a provision in a BBA to endorse to transfer. And the RP is, uh, RP has arbitrarily fixed. This is a transfer fee. Mm -hmm. This is the transfer fee. I will transfer this flat. Rather, will substitute the name. I will not say transfer because it has to be registered with the registrar. I will say substitute your name or assign this flat in your favor, provided you pay me the 100 rupees per square weight for such and such flat. This is to what is happening in the north. Have you seen? Assigned to whom? Assigned to the new buyer, which is which is which is as good as change of ownership for no, the no, flat. Sir, IBC is allowing financial creditors to assign their debts to other persons. At times, even banks assign their debts to ARC companies during the CIRB process. In fact, IBC has provided... No, no, it is, it is, it is not a debt. It is not a debt because you see, I will take an example of a particular example. I have a flat in A project. You know, I had taken in 2012. I know the home, the, 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 this project is under CIRB. Right. So, so someone approaches me, I say, this is my flat. Now, I don't want to keep it because, you know, indefinite, uh, indefinitely. So, please transfer it. Right. Fine. You pay me the 100 rupees, but it's records in the name of a B. This is to what is happening. Can a RP can do like this? No, no, it cannot. There are specific provisions where certain provisions have to be complied with to do this. There is a provision. But there is no provision so far as IBC is concerned. No, no, no. There because is no... only just he's a custodian. No, 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 sir. During the CIRP, even there is a provision that a financial creditor at any time can assign its debt to some other person for which an mm -hmm. agreement can be entered into. There is some provision in IBC. I'm quite sure of this. But mm -hmm. I don't know in your case, whatever you are talking about, whether those provisions are being applied to the That is another thing. But there is a provision in IBC. Yeah. No, what I mean to say, because, you know, in a, a home buyer CARP, a lot of discretion is being exercised by the RP or IPs in the in the, in the absence of a specific provision in the IBC, as I, well as non-clarification. When this IBC was enacted, it had not contemplated that home buyers will yeah, come. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. I do agree with so you. That you is know, why perhaps lacuna also that uh, once they are recognized, Perhaps uh, all the regulations comprising those situations have not been uh, enacted by the concerned authorities, be it the parliament or the IB IBBI itself. But just uh, for a minute, I will, just for a minute, I will take you to through a very crude example. Yes. You know, in a in a Noida, Noida is a completely leasehold, yes. completely leasehold, and there is a specific provision under the lease deed. Neither any development agreement nor the plot can be assigned or not any collaboration can be entered with any prospective builder. Okay. There is a specific provision without seeking an approval from the node authority. Correct. So that means of the lease deed, he has entered into collaboration with B, with a B, when collaboration is illegal since inception. From the very beginning, because lease deed doesn't permit the original loyalty of the land to enter into any collaboration with any prospective buyer. Correct. So, in such cases, so, uh, you are for Japan. Hmm. A has entered. 
you know, I am discussing for the because you know this is a practical difficulty which I have seen and I am noticing. Although I am not a harpy of any uh, home buyers, just I find it interested. This is to what is happening because this is an inherent lacuna in the IBC. You see, the prospective buyer, who prospective builder, who has developed the project, the land doesn't belong to him. The land belongs to it so far as the Noida Authority record is concerned. Now what happened? Because I have uh, uh, the flat has been allotted to me by B. Because he has constructed, but he is not a owner of the land. So Correct. I move an application to the IB under section 7, 11, 9, whatever this may be, before the A. Say this is to what has happened. Now the CRARP has commenced against the builder, not right. against the original LOT of the land. Because you know the, whose land is of A, which is the legal owner. And if somebody has constructed it amount to illegal construction because it is not the this is sort of proper sanction and the CARP is happening against the builder because he has constructed a whole building. This is what I'm only talking about the Noida or the places where the leasehold land is there. So yeah. how can it be? Because you know. This is a fundamental violation of the principles or the preamble of the IBC because only just I have been allotted the land by the builder or the flat by the builder. That's why I found an association of the 100 buyers is there and filed an application before A and A EU is not seeking who, whose land is it is. Whether the project which has been constructed, it belongs to the same person or to the person who is not actual. So this is to what is the problem and I think it is happening in the Noida and the A is simply entertaining this application but one thing we should uh, know i mean in that in terms of the provisions of the code itself i am saying because financial debt we defined we defined in terms of money only we are not dealing with property though the interest of home buyer is allotment of unit that is true interest of home buyer and even if a resolution applicant comes he will also in the interest of home buyers you should offer that I will complete this project and a lot and I will give this unit to you at whatever terms, whatever will be part of the resolution plan. Having said that, but as far as claims are concerned, claims are based on the agreement between parties on monetary, on the consideration paid for allotment of a particular unit and at a project site. Correct? Claims will be admitted on the basis of the agreement or on the basis of the balance sheet or whatever all the records of the corporate debtor and even all those crp proceedings whatever take place takes place in accordance with the amount of amount of claim admitted voting rights are decided based on that so as far as property legality of uh, ownership of property is concerned because you are saying cd is not the owner owner is because leasehold rights have been sold and cd is only having some collaboration agreement correct and that is that is too illegal. That also illegal. Illegal, but yes. per se, but per se between whom? Between the leasehold between, right between owner. The LOT, L between LOT the and leasehold it. right owner and the C D, correct? No, 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 no. It is between the leasy, between the sub leasy, because you know the, the lesser is uh, not authority. So between the leasy. So sir, the project ka license. Hai, you are saying he is not the owner. He only has an agreement with the lessee who has a leasehold agreement with Noida Authority. Correct? Correct. He is the legal owner. He is the legal Correct. owner. Owner, owner, ownership vets west with Noida Authority. Leasehold mm -hmm. rights west with some, some, or some person who has made yes. agreement with the builder that please mm -hmm. you you will you buy these licenses from the Noida Authority. For construction of oh. the entire project, correct? Correct. Yes. Now, as far as the agreement with the home buyers are concerned, we are mm -hmm. not looking into the legality of land, but we are looking into the consideration that has passed and the unit to be allotted. If we get into this, that these units, because ultimately, I am CRP ke proceedings, ke mein nahi ra, but even in leasehold agreements, if you don't see just Noida, but even the Barakamba Road area, all are leasehold, leasehold land? No, it's a little bit of a difference because you know, that's why I'm discussing the particular example of a Noida authority. 
I'm not going because I'm aware of in surroundings to what is happening that may be to some extent legal and may be made legal. But so far as the NODA authority lease, uh, NODA authority lease is not curable. The reason being that because the stamp duty involves a huge uh, state exchequer. And now what they are doing, only 100 rupees stamp paper they are doing. The project is 250 crores. Say 7% stamp duty is there. So see, it comes in a it comes in a 50, 60 crores. So, so they ultimately, are home buyer is ultimately, sir, home buyer is relying, is having faith with the builder. ये किसी और को नहीं बेचेगा एक बार मुझे अलॉट हो गया तो वो अपने अपने पर्सनल रिकॉर्ड में म्यूटेटेड रखेगा मुझे और आगे चल के कभी जब भी ये लीज होल्ड से फ्री होल्ड होने लगेगा तब मेरे नाम पे ऑन पेमेंट ऑफ सर्टेन चार्जेस आई विल गेट इट दिस इज द फेथ दैट पीपल आर हैविंग इन द नोएडा बिल्डर्स इज दैट राइट नहीं देखिए थोड़ा सा मेरा इसमें इसमें डिफरेंट आई हैव अ रेस्पेक्ट ड्यू रेस्पेक्ट आई हैव अ डिफरेंट्स ऑफ ओपिनियन बिकॉज यू नो एंड ऑफ द डे व्हाट है पास दिस इज ए स्टॉप गैप अरेंजमेंट अभी बिल्डर ने सिर्फ एक एग्रीमेंट किया है जितनी भी लेआउट की सेंक्शन आती हैं वो सब ओरिजिनल लीजी के नाम में आएंगी सेकेंडली जब प्रोजेक्ट कंप्लीट हो जाएगा तो वो जो रजिस्ट्री uh, होगी रजिस्ट्री भी ओरिजिनली कराएगा लेकिन इस भी दुर्भाग्य ये है रजिस्ट्री होती भी है सर जिसमें उसमें प्रॉब्लम क्या है कि जो इसने बीच में आदमी रखा है ना जो इस बिल्डर को दिया गया है वो सिर्फ एक पैसा मिंट कर रहा है और वो करेगा नहीं करेगा वो डेट इज जहां इनका आपस में डिस्प्यूट खड़ा हुआ थोड़ा सा भी उसका सफरा कौन रहता है सफरा रहता है एलओटी और एलओटी क्या हो रहा है आईबीसी में कोई प्रोविजन नहीं है क्योंकि लीज हो लैंड जब नक्शे उसके नाम अप्रूव हो रहे हैं रजिस्ट्री वो करेगा तो आप जो ओरिजिनल लीजी है उसको क्यों नहीं घसीटते हैं क्योंकि एक्चुअल में जो एसिड्स है वो तो उसकी है बिल्डर तो कहेगा मेरा तो पैसा खा लिया जितना बनाना था बना लिया मैं घर जा रहा हूँ अपने में अब तुम्हें जो करना कर लो लिक्विडेशन में ले आना ले जा लो अब उसमें सफर कौन कर रहा है सफर कर रहा है वो जिसको अलॉट हुआ है और जिसके पास में लैंड है वो वजह से निकल जाता है दिस इज ये सबसे बड़ा प्रोविजन है जिसको आज तक कोई समझ नहीं पाता है Even in Gurgaon, I have seen some projects. जिसमें क्या होता है कि land owners they make an agreement कि from let's say one tenth of the land they sell it to some X company और उस X company को development rights पूरे land का दे देते हैं कि तुम उसके नाम से license issue करा लो DTC के साथ नहीं वहाँ का सब provision अलग है I am aware of कि गुड़गांव के अंदर क्या प्रोविजंस हैं लेकिन मैं तो आपको एक नोडा का एक क्रूड एग्जांपल बताया क्रूड एग्जांपल बताया क्योंकि सीएआरपी होम बायर्स की होती है बट आई एम ट्राइंग टू से इवन इन गुड़गांव दिस दिस इज एक्चुअली इलीगलिटी इलीगलिटी इन द सेंस कि एक आदमी को आपने 10% लैंड बेच दिया पर उसके बाद उसको राइट्स 100% लैंड के दे दिए डेवलपमेंट लेकिन लाइसेंस मिलता है ना वहां पर यहां तो ये है कि जैसे ही वो नोडा अथॉरिटी में जाएगा नोडा अथॉरिटी में जाएगा तो सर जो आपने ओनरशिप का इशू रेज किया है मैं उसकी बात कर रहा हूं 90% of land is still with the landlord hmm. the ownership is still with the landlord but the 10% of land which has been sold us 10% malik ko 100% land ka development right mil gaya under the agreement jiske basis pe wo license license bana license dena hai ab kal ko wo jo development agreement jo uh, developer hai wo insolvency mein chala gaya to land aur renewal of license mein bade issues aa rahe hain नहीं वो देखिए टू सम एक्सटेंट आई कैन से बिकॉज इट इज इन द नॉलेज ऑफ द लाइसेंसिंग अथॉरिटी बट हियर यू सी इन द नोएडा अथॉरिटी इवन नोएडा अथॉरिटी इज अनअवे ऑफ द मूवमेंट यू रिपोर्ट टू द नोएडा अथॉरिटी व्हाट विल हैपन दे से नाउ यू हैव टेक दिस सो नाउ योर एग्रीमेंट इज यू नो इट इज अ ब्रीच ऑफ कंडीशन एंड बिकॉज देयर इज अ नो प्रोविजन ऑफ अलाउइंग और ग्रांटिंग यू परमिशन फॉर एंटर इनटू द कोलैबोरेशन एग्रीमेंट बिकॉज इट इफ यू सी यूपी स्टैंप एक्ट इट इज एज गुड एज एग्रीमेंट टू सेल so they say you have to pay first of all the stamp duty the complete stamp duty and the moment he agrees to pay the complete viability of the project goes 
so sir, this is to what is happening ye legal legality jo iski hai you are absolutely right technically kafi aadmi in cheezon mein phas jata hai but once uh, courts are being approached and i am especially saying to high courts and supreme courts they definitely take interest ki wo interest dekhte hain ki jo home buyers ka ya public at large ka jo paisa jahan phasa hua hota hai they approach usually is equitable that aap dekh lijiye amrapali mein kya hua hai या फिर बाकी यहाँ का सभी देख लीजिए सुपर टेक देख लीजिए अरण्या देख लीजिए बहुत प्रोजेक्ट है जितने फंसे हो और ये फंसे इसीलिए हैं क्योंकि नोएडा अथॉरिटी से हमने तो इनको परमिशन ही नहीं दी थी बनाने के लिए अगर किसी की लैंड तो अगर वही बना रहा है सुपर टेक आए आई 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 डोंट नो इफ आई रिमेंबर दिस करेक्टली और नॉट इन सुपर टेक और समवेयर रेजोल्यूशन प्लान इटसेल्फ वाज व प्रपोज्ड बाय द होम बायर्स दैट दे विल पे सम सो मच अमाउंट एंड दे विल देमसेल्फ्स they will themselves get the pro- entire project constructed kuch is tarah ki kuch baat chali thi resolution plan so, but it was ha, ha, wo supreme court ne supreme court ne usme kiya wo chal bhi raha hai iske andar se amrapali ka aur supertech ka lekin yeah. jo aur projects hain unme problem acha aur kya hota hai ye log sab ka iska consolidation kar lete hain plot ka different companies ke naam mein leke chote chote plot i know i know consolidation kar lete hain project complete kar dete hain uske andar se so when you call this a one project on the different lands which belong to the different entities so how can it be make possible तो उसमें प्रॉब्लम्स क्या है लीगल प्रॉब्लम्स है जिसमें आरपी को विद यू रेस्पेक्ट आई एम सेइंग कि आरपी हो या आईपी हो या जो भी हो वो उसको जो बेसिक प्रॉब्लम्स हैं जो फंडामेंटल प्रॉब्लम्स हैं उसको ना तो प्रेजेंट कर पाते होम बायर्स क्योंकि उनको भी पता नहीं है कैसे प्रोजेक्ट करना है इसको कोर्ट में जाके और सेकेंडली ये इनहेरेंट लैक होना है इमीडिएटली नाउ सपोज इफ आई एम अपॉइंटेड फॉर द होम बायर्स आई विल गो नो नो नाउ बिकम अ कस्टोडियन ऑफ दिस प्रोजेक्ट without understanding to what to whom this land is allotted how that much is. it has been paid and what problems may i, I may encounter with the nod authority in execution then thereafter you're absolutely right so, yeah, no, boy, it is all in faith ye yeah, matlab wo good faith pe chal raha hai otherwise jahan pe phas gaya aap that is true main to just academic discussions ke liye because now this subject is being discussed to yeah. meri thodi si isme curiosity thi that's why i took the liberty to i'm very close relative of uh, yours or yourself is very much stuck in these projects i can seriously i can foresee this <laughs> no i am not stuck because you know lot of persons came to me only just to yeah. ask me to what what can we can do so i told him Basically, this is what is the problem on that person had also asked me about this thing noida ke andar jo aapne mujhe bataya na somebody was saying ki mujhe hmm. aise builder approach kar raha hai should i do this or not maine bola dekho legality puri dekho us hisab se banta nahi hai risk lene wali baat hai lekin agar good faith mein sare log kar hi rahe hain to bas dekh lo bhai usse koi dikkat nahi so i thank you very much thank you very much uh, any other doubts sir any any or or any any other insightful topic or discussion we can have because we can always share our experience with ibc matters i hope many of us must have had done at least one or two assignments of ibc no yeah at least i have done one cirp but not for home buyers only for voluntary liquidations that i am two three cases that is great that is great sir one should not be of home buyers <laughs> so that is bigger thing So even I have not done any home buyers project. I have done one IT based company and one uh, hydroelectric project. Hydroelectric was a big one. So, any other doubts, sir? Any other topic? I think it's quite. Uh, in the end, I was uh, I, we had a good, fruitful discussion at least with the two or three of our past participants. Any other participant who wants to share any of his experience in IBC matters? or any doubts we one has facing right now or while doing any of the current assignments or any other doubt or any other hypothetical query if if at all coming on mind please don't uh, hesitate to share with us so uh, uh, anjali ji you are online anyone from icsi yes sir i am here ji ji so uh, what should we end this so i said sure okay so i think thank uh, you so much sir for taking out time and addressing the session on webinar on anatomy of ibc case law on such a short notice and thank you very much for sharing your experience and learning and making the interaction uh, session more interactive 
and i request you sir kindly share your ppt's and the bank details all right thank you thanks a lot thanks to everyone for bearing with me